Hello, everybody. Uh, this video is meant to give you another shorter little lecture on basically techniques for delivering a speech effectively. At this point in the semester, we have covered oh, our various ways to build a speech, and we've covered pretty much the most important things you need to know. One, that there's five effective elements of a good introduction, that there are three elements of an effective conclusion, and that you need to connect your main points and subpoints, which all should be logically supported with good rationale, uh, reasoning, logic, and arguments, and that each of those main points should be connected by a series of different types of connectives, i.e. your transitions, your signposts, your internal previews, and your internal summaries. So if you can do all that stuff that I just said, that is public speaking you will be above most people who go out into the world and speak publicly because you know how to build effective presentations. This week and in this particular video now, we're gonna start working on putting the sprinkles on top of your speech cake. Okay, these are the little tips and tricks that help now to set you above people who just know how to write good speeches, but now how to deliver them as well. Okay, so jumping in here. Okay, a lot of us feel like this person. You know, a lot of us feel like this little kid and it's pretty nerve wracking when you get up there. And even if you know and you have a good speech built, which definitely helps with confidence, there's a lot of other little things that we need to take into account as we get ready to basically present our speeches in front of people. Okay, so I'm gonna jump down and basically this video is gonna be broken up into two parts. First is methods of competent delivery. Okay, so there are various ways that we can deliver our speeches. I'm going to go over four of them here in the next few minutes. The second part of this video will be that I focus on specific behaviors that people tend to have. I call them delivery quirks. Things that your body does or you do because your nerves, because you're uninformed of what you need to be careful of. And so we're going to cover those and I'll give you some little pro tips and tricks for how to avoid falling into a lot of those behaviors and quirks. Okay, so starting with methods of delivery. Okay, there's a lot of different ways that we can present our messages, but there generally tends to be four that can be effective when they are used properly. Okay, so our first one impromptu. This is you don't really know or haven't got a lot of time to actually prepare. Okay, impromptu delivery is one of the types. And so you just do your best with the little bit of time you have. The good thing is, is that we have lower expectations when we're giving these patterns of presentations. People recognize we're on the spot, but that doesn't mean we can't do things to be a little bit better, right? So I've got my little picture here, two guys in their underwear. The first thing that you can do to become a better impromptu deliverer is recognize that we still can be aware of when we're going to receive awards or have to give up, get up and present impromptu in front of people. Just like our members of our band here not wearing pants to their acceptance speech, we have a small understanding of when we're gonna receive an award, whether it be in class, whether it be for being a good employee. Usually there's a rough idea. Usually somebody asks you if you will attend that certain meeting, which tells you there's something going on. Okay, so always anticipate the possibility of impromptu speaking. Okay, when you're given these types of presentations, we've talked about how stories are a good way to get people engaged. Well, with this short little impromptu delivery that you're gonna give, it helps to draw on a lot of your life experiences and knowledge for the content of your speech. Rather than a bunch of thank yous or talking about why you're awesome, just share a few good stories, a good few knowledges and experiences you've gained from whatever it is you're receiving the award for, and you'll be good to go, okay? And then lastly, <coughs> excuse me, and this is just a general tip, um, have an outline in your head for any kind of impromptu speech you might give. Okay, and this is just a general guideline, but whether it be awards, whether it be recognitions for something at work, um, you should generally know that the same outline we've been working on for all of our speeches so far this semester can work for this speech too. Start off really quick, attention getter, and give a little bit of credibility for why you're probably up there and what's going on. Uh, lead into a couple little points you wanna make with the preview statement. Hurry and make those points. I want to thank my family. I want to thank moms and dads, my teachers who got me where I'm at, my bosses who are awesome, and end with the joke. That's a very simple outline, but if you have that in your head and you're ready to go, even if you are completely blindsided, 
you'll know the general gist of what you want to accomplish in that impromptu speech and you'll blow people away. The good thing with impromptu is because there's low expectations, if we do really good with them anyways, people think we're pretty cool. It's a good sign of, for credibility for us. Okay, so next type of delivery we can use is manuscript. Okay, and that is reading the speech word for word. So that means you literally pull out your paper and you present. Now, <coughs> many of you have been in my classes before, you know that that is a big no-no in public speaking in my opinion. Um, but there are times where manuscript delivery is necessary. And a lot of times it's when you want to reduce legal problems, you want to avoid them altogether because word for word phrasing is something that's super important with what you're doing. So I got an example here, you know, a little video you can watch, but it doesn't matter who the president is. We always have them sworn in an inauguration. We have them repeat word for word the things that we're going to hold them to while they are in office, right? And there's a reason we have them, we read that to them and have them repeat word for word what we're going to say, and that is to cover our legal basis, right? So in case we ever have issues with anybody, we can make sure and say, well, yeah, you were said these things, and we're going to hold you accountable for them, right? So there's a good time for manuscript deliveries, right? But it's important to recognize there are plenty of drawbacks, okay? So obviously it appears scripted because it is, okay? If you mess up in a scripted reading, it's a little bit harder to recover from because now it's awkward. You messed up something that's as simple as reading a script, but now you've lost your place, you're feeling uncomfortable, you gotta find it again. It's just not as natural as a quick little oops and moving on like it will be in some of the deliveries that we talk about here in a second. Okay, and then lastly, because you're reading, by definition, that means you're not looking at your audience. And as we've talked about this semester, and we'll talk about more later this video, eye contact is a pretty big deal for public speaking. So you need it. And with manuscript delivery, if you're reading, you can't have it. Okay, so some tips if you're going to be a manuscript deliverer for any time with any kind of presentation you give. One, don't use your speech, don't use your slides, don't use your paper as a crux. Okay, a lot of people want to lean on note cards because they just don't want to take the time to prepare to practice or they get feel like they're going to be so nervous they can't do it. Well, you are digging your own hole at that point, right? The moment you start leaning on notes as a crutch, that means that you're going to fall over the moment they're kicked out from underneath you. The second you have a technical difficulty, the second your note card's out of order, you're done. So don't use them as a crutch. If you have to read, read for the sake of getting word to words right, and then don't read more, okay? It's as simple as that. Um, make sure that you still are working on those oral elements though. Even though you're reading, you can look up from time to time and just have a few parts memorized. You can still make your gestures. So while you're reading, you can still get excited. You can still move around. And you definitely ought to make sure that you're fluctuating your voice. Again, things that we'll talk about later in this video, but these things still apply, whether you're a manuscript deliverer, an impromptu, or any other kind, okay? And then lastly, practice. So if you're gonna read, even though it's reading, a lot of people tend to see that as, I don't need to prepare, and that's not true. The moment you get up, if you haven't prepared and something goes wrong, manuscript's gonna backfire on you completely. Okay, so that's the type of delivery. It has its uses, avoiding legal troubles, making sure we say things word for word, but you can tell it's not my favorite. Okay, another type of delivery that a lot of students will tend to give is a word-for-word -word speech for memory. Okay, a memorized delivery is what we call it, and that's basically every single word is so trapped up in your brain that we follow it just like we were reading a script, but we don't have to read it. Okay, so obviously better than just reading the script, right? It seems a little bit more natural, but here's a couple drawbacks. Sounds super robotic. Every semester I have a student and they get up and they start just going like this. Hello, everybody. Insert joke here. My name is blank. Today, I'm going to talk to you about blank. I'm going to accomplish this by blank, blank, blank. Thank you. Let's begin. Da, 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 da. That's super robotic. It's super inhuman sounding. Remember that we want people to think we're a good person. We have good character, that we care about our audience. Robots don't care about audiences. Robots don't have good character because they're not a person. You don't want to be a robot when you present. Okay, and memorized delivery tends to rub people off that way. Okay, so another big thing is when you mess up in a memorized delivery, it's awful because now your brain's gonna panic because you are completely relying on memorized words that are in your head and you can't bring them back. You messed up, you send yourself into a panic, 
and now you have nothing to get yourself back on track. So they can be some pretty bad mess ups with memorized types of deliveries. So this brings us to some tips. If you're gonna do it, again, I'd say it's better than a manuscript delivery. Um, it's better than being in prepared for an impromptu, okay? Practice, 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 practice is a really big one on this. Um, I've got this video here. I'd highly recommend watching Daniel Beatty knock knock. Okay, he does a really good job and you can see how much time and effort he's put into making sure that his speech is in his head, okay? Another big thing, because you don't have to look at a manuscript, that means to help overcome some of the roboticness, look at your audience. Really dwell on that eye contact so they can see that you are looking at them, they can connect with you. It helps you be a little bit more relatable, okay? If you forget words, make sure that you take a breath, don't panic, and even though it won't be perfectly what you memorized, push forward in a way that gets you somewhat what you were trying to say until your brain catches back onto the script and then you can fall back into that. Okay, but the big thing you don't wanna do is just pause or not talk at all or quit, okay? Do your best and if you've practiced enough, even though maybe the words won't come to you for a moment, you'll still have the general idea from the outline that you built beforehand. Okay, and then lastly, and this is just a big one, mistakes happen, especially in these types of deliveries. Like we've talked about previously in the semester, you don't owe anybody anything. So don't apologize for mistakes. If you make a mistake, don't say sorry, and awkwardly wait and pause and hope that people won't judge you too harshly. Don't, don't care what they think. Take the time you need, compose yourself, recognize you're doing your best, and then move on when you're ready to go again. Okay, so that's memorized delivery. Now, with each of these first three types of deliveries, you've noticed I've had drawbacks for them, okay? Some tips, some drawbacks. This last type of delivery is the one that tends to be the most recommended by all speaking uh, professors, public speaking teachers, and it's because it works in most situations. Obviously, if you're avoiding legal trouble, you wanna go down the manuscript route. If you're going through a performance, maybe the memorized route, but for a general day-to-day -day presentation, extemporaneous delivery is your go-to that you're gonna to wanna to use, okay? So notice here it says spontaneous but researched. It's like mixing an impromptu speech with a memorized speech, okay? And I like to say it's like memorizing your entire speech and then unmemorizing it a little bit so it's not so robotic, okay? Basically, if you're doing an extemporaneous speech right, it comes off supernatural, okay? It's, it's like you are just talking with friends, but in a formal public setting, okay? So notice again, I don't have drawbacks with this one. There aren't many drawbacks to extemporaneous speaking. If you know how to do this and you do it right, usually you only see good that come from them, okay? So, <coughs> excuse me, be spontaneous, okay? Be friendly. Be natural while you get up and you present. Just talk to people. I want to point out, I said spontaneous but researched, okay? Extemporaneous speaking is not just winging it, okay? That is definitely not what you want to think about with this. Research means you know exactly what you're talking about. You know your topic. You have spent time memorizing your speech, okay? but you've dialed back a little bit so you're not just word for word quoting a script, but rather you know your main points, you know your arguments you wanna make, you know your content, and then you get up, you follow the general pattern that you have, but if you mess up, if you stutter a little bit, you just shrug it off and you move forward with it. So I would highly recommend watching Steve Jobs introducing the iPhone at Macworld 2007. Great video. He was always known for being a really good extemporaneous speaker. And if you watch this video, you'll see how he knows exactly what's coming and he uses that to be able to give a really good presentation. Okay, because it makes him sound spontaneous like he's just talking with his audience. It allows him to be able to look at them and focus on them and interact with them rather than slides or a piece of paper in front of you. And then lastly, allows better response to the audience. You'll notice that they clap, they get super excited in that video. Well, he thrives on that and he uses that to make the presentation even better. You're able to react to your audience. If you see that they need a moment to celebrate, to be sad, 
You can give them that moment with extemporaneous speaking, but you can't do that with pausing a memorized delivery or a manuscript as you continue to read. You have to just do your presentation. Extemporaneous, you can build and work yourself around the audience, which is awesome. Okay, so there's some great benefits that come from this. And again, you can see I have delivered with notes. My recommendation with notes is to build your slides effectively. Most presentation situations, you can build yourself a good PowerPoint, good Google Slides. I'm not telling you to sit there and read them. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But if you memorize your speech and are ready to go based off your mind, okay, you can every now and again glance back at your slides and be able to use those as a quick reference point if you ever do want to remember something or if you forgot. And it makes it a lot more natural as opposed to having a giant note card in front of you or just reading something. Okay, so that's the notes we're talking about with this type of presentation. So a couple quick tips. Okay, in this class, we've been building preparation outlines. I have been making you do word for word everything you're gonna say. Okay, that's for building speeches. Okay, in the real world, when you're done with my class and you're allowed to use your outlines and your presentations again, I would recommend making presentational outlines. Okay, and that's where after you've made a preparation outline and you've built everything word for word, you dial them back and instead of having full sentences, you break it up into one or two words that are the main points of the outline, okay, of the speech. And then that way you just have a couple words to remind yourself, okay, yes, now main point one, I was going to talk about Pokemon here. And main point two, okay, I'm going to move on to um, dog fighting for children, right? So whatever the case may be, you can use that in your head, that little presentation outline if you need it. And again, that's what your slides end up becoming by definition of how they're supposed to be built and look. Okay, next tip, be familiar with your speech content. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Don't wing your presentation. You need to know the content of what you're going to say. It needs to be a memorized delivery, and then you dial back just a little bit so that you're not sounding like a robot regurgitating words from your paper. Okay, and so what that means is it takes practice, practice, practice. For extemporaneous deliveries to go off well, you're going to spend hours going over your presentations and making sure that everything sounds okay. And obviously the hours go down as you get better at this, as you get more experience. But for those of you just starting out and you're wanting to do this the right way, you will be surprised at how much time it'll take you to make this come off more natural and to get yourself at a level where you feel confident to do this in front of people. Okay, so those are our different delivery types. Okay, all four of those, a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that would be some content that you'd wanna know for a test that would be coming up in the future, right? Different ways that I can deliver my speech effectively. And again, even though I was a little bit harsh on memorized and manuscript and impromptu deliveries, it's good to remember that they each have their purpose. You can't give an extemporaneous delivery when it's an impromptu speech. You didn't have time to research and super prepare a lot of stuff, okay? If you're avoiding legal troubles, you need to do manuscript delivery. You need to make sure that you're word for word saying what's important. And then lastly, <coughs> excuse me, if you want to do super dramatic effects, just like theater, you've got to have stuff memorized and ready to go. Okay, but for your general day-to-day -day use, extemporaneous delivery is the go-to, and it's the one that I really emphasize in this class. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me, let's move on to some delivery quirks. Okay, so there's all sorts of things that we need to be aware of when we are getting ready to deliver a speech. Okay, so I've got this list here. You can pause it, you can look through it, but I'm going to jump in and just start going through each one of them. First and foremost, I've already mentioned this a bunch just in this video, eye contact is a must with your audience. It allows you to connect with them. It allows them to feel close. It allows them to feel like you care. Your eyes need to be with your audience, okay? Not above. A lot of you have been taught, look above your audience. Look just below them. Look up to the sides and the corners above. We know when you are not looking at us in the stands, okay? You need to look people in the eyes. And some of you are going to think this is awkward, but always, okay? Here's the trick. Pick three or four people at different points in the audience so that it makes it look like you're looking around at everybody. Pick three or four people and bounce between them. 
spend a few seconds looking at somebody in the eyes here, a few seconds looking at somebody in the eyes here, a few seconds looking at somebody in the eyes here, and so on, and repeat. Look back and forth, back and forth, every few seconds. It allows people to feel like you're connecting with them. It allows people who aren't the people you're directly looking at to still feel like you're looking at the whole audience so that they feel like you're still connecting with them. They might not be directly getting looked at, but you're looking at the audience and they get that. Okay. You want to look at people because it helps you be close. So a little tip for those of you, we're all, um, usually if we're watching this video, we're doing online presentations for the class. You want to look at your webcam. As hard as it is, you want to watch yourself over in your corner of your camera speaking. You want to watch yourself down here. You want to look at your slides or something that you've tried to sneakily hide from your professor on your screen. It doesn't work. We know that you're looking at your screen instead of me. Okay. I know when you're looking down at notes, so will employers, so will audience members. You want to make sure to do your best and look at the camera as often as you can. And it takes work, but that's, that's what you want is we still want to feel like we're being connected with. Okay. So that's eye contact. <coughs> the next we've got is voice. And I love the Ferris Bueller guy here. It's a good little video. If you want to go watch a 30 second clip and get a good laugh, but he's famous for a pretty big reason. And that's because his voice is so monotonous, so unchanging, so boring. Right, he stood for all high school teachers of that era with how he sounded calling out Bueller, Bueller. Okay, we don't want to be him when we speak. There's a lot of different things that we need to make sure we're taking into consideration when we're using our voices. Okay, so the big word that we're going to want to remember is inflection. Okay, and inflection means change, it means that you're going to get yourself higher and lower, you're going to get yourself excited and push out. But when it's time to be a little quieter, to not push out as much, to draw people in, louder, quieter, higher, lower, faster, getting excited, talking about something that really matters, and then slowing it down when you really want to make a point. Okay, then we need inflection with our voice. Now, there are those of you, and I've got speaking rate just so people can look here through some slides and pauses they want. There are those of you who are super monotone, like me. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing bad. And we're not talking singing. You might have a gorgeous singing voice, but your speaking voice is low. It's monotone. For lack of a better term, it's boring. There's nothing you can do with it. The quicker we own up to it, the quicker we can do something about it while speaking. Monotone folk are going to have to do this stuff a lot more than non-monotone folk. Okay. You're going to have to speak faster. By definition, many of you will see this on your videos. I will tell you, I need more excitement and I need more energy. Okay, in general, that's you're moving around, that's you're just getting pumped up, that's you're smiling. But by doing those things, by definition, you start getting yourself excited, smiling and pumping up notice. I start talking a little bit faster. My voice starts naturally inflecting and that's what we're shooting for. Okay, so monotones, you're gonna have to beat the monotone voice. You have to be excited. Okay, so all this comes in the, fo the form of inflections and voice volumes and pitches and rates and all that good stuff. Okay, for those of you who are not monotone, I recognize this works on low voices and high voices too. Those of you who are super high, super excited, super fast talking all the time, you're going to have to slow down and you're going to have to speak a little bit deeper too. Because too high and shrill makes you sound a little bit incredible. Uncredible. Let's stick with uncredible, right? We don't want you to be too extreme either way, okay? And so a good cure for both is to just make sure you have good energy and excitement when you present. Okay, so I've got this slide here. I'll let people look through it. And I don't wanna make a big deal of it for this video for the sake of time, but make sure that you're saying your words correctly. Okay, no matter where you're from when you're watching this video, we have a tendency to say certain words the wrong way. There's plenty of videos that are wonderful for this. There's plenty of images you can go look at. Here's some examples of things that people say incorrectly, okay, and you can look at them. Um, just be careful with this stuff and always learn the dialects. Listen to people talk as you're around. You don't want to be the outsider who comes in and uses the wrong terminology, okay? So another big word, and this is the one, when I say delivery quirks, most people think of two things. They think of their hands and they think of filler words. Okay, oh, I say, um, okay, all right. 
those are definitely distracting. And if you want to watch a funny video on this, watch Barack Obama account. He says uh, a lot. I mean, I think I actually have a little note here. Yep, in his debate against Romney, he said, uh, 236 times. In the short 36 second video, he ends up saying it, let's see, about 30, 30 times. That's a lot of us and ums, okay? That's when it becomes a super big problem. All of us are gonna um and uh a little bit. But when it becomes that big, people start spending more time counting your uhs and your ums than they do listening to your presentation, much like this video that was made here. So whatever your word is, and I've given a list of ones that people tend to use in this day and age, watch the words that you put at the ends of your sentences. Usually they always come at the end, and usually the reason we do it is because we're nervous and we want to fill that little gap of silence with something. Okay, um, all right, you got that? We don't like that pause that happens when we finish our sentences. So we fill them, hence filler words. So a good suggestion I have for anybody who wants to permanently take care of these out of your vocabulary, while you are practicing your presentations, <coughs> excuse me, stop and start over every single time you use one of these words. So as you're getting ready to do a four to six minute presentation, a five to seven minute presentation, every single time you say, okay, yeah, um, all right, perfect, moving on, uh, start over every single time. And if you need help, if you don't catch them yourself, you don't think you're catching them, ask somebody to sit there with you and for the first 10 minutes, stop you for you. By the time you get done, it'll probably take you an hour. My freshman year, it took me an hour. Every single time I needed to stop, I did. But by the end, I don't do ums and uhs in my presentations anymore. Maybe in a long-winded presentation for class or in a video, I might pull out a couple, but most of the time I talk in my regular day-to-day -day conversations, my ums, my uhs, my all rights are gone. It just takes time becoming aware of them and be practicing, much like you would basketball or playing the piano, practicing to stop doing them. It takes effort. So another big one that people worry about, and that is body movements and gestures. And guess what? You should be worried about it. What are you doing with your body while you are presenting? You do want to move around and it's okay to do that. A lot of people, they get up in front of a classroom and they plant their feet and they don't move for four to six minutes. That shows people that you're nervous. I call that being a stone statue, okay? You don't want to do that. <laughs> but you also don't want to move too much. Some people move forward, backwards, forward, backwards, forward, backwards, left, right, left, right, step on foot, hunch over, step on foot, lean. All of that becomes super distracting, super quick for people. So the big thing with movement that you want to know is whatever you decide to do to move, you want to have purpose. I like to recommend people, if you're standing in front of a big projector slide screen, uh, move from left and move to the right side of it. Okay, never stop it in the middle. You don't want to get in the way of your slides. But if you're over on the left, after you get done with main point one, move over to the right, which gives you a little bit of motion, changes things up for people, and then work through main point two. And when you get done with main point two, you can move back over to main point three on the left. That has purpose, it gives a little bit of movement, and it mixes things up for people, but it's not too much that it just seems like you're nervous and you're pacing back and forth. You can also move forward and back into the audience. So I'm not talking planting your feet and going like this, but rather walk out and get closer to your audience for a little bit. Walk out about halfway into the stands, about halfway into wherever you're at, spend a little time being closer to people, walk back to the front and plant yourself back by your slides. Then go down another aisle, next main point. Again, those have purpose and those are doing something for you as opposed to just the stuff that makes you look nervous. Okay, so that's your whole body. Let's talk about your hands for a moment, your gestures. Okay, so first and foremost, we want to avoid anything and everything that your hands normally like to do when you're up speaking. 
That is playing with your hair, itching your face, scratching your beard, playing with your hair, moving your glasses, slapping your pants, putting your hands in your pockets, folding your arms, clasping your hands, putting your hands behind your back. Avoid all of that, all of it. What you want to do is you want to move your hands in front of you, hold them forward, and then just let them drop. That's it. Hand them forward, and I call this resetting. Drop them. And now as you begin to talk, it's okay to move your hands. You want to talk like you do with friends, like you're having a normal conversation. When you get excited, you're moving your hands. You're saying, it's over there, it's over here. Can you believe what I'm just saying? That's all okay. Right? Obviously, it's in reason. If you're somebody who's way over the top and doing this all the time, dial it back. But in our conversations, this is just natural. This is how we talk, and we want to do this while we are up presenting too. So drop, reset, and now just be natural as you talk again, just like you would with some friends. Okay, so be careful with all that. The one last thing I'd like to uh, leave you with as far as gestures and movement, don't chew gum. One, makes your words not come out, people can't hear them. Two, nobody in any movie ever that was chewing gum wasn't a jerk. It just looks like a jerk thing to do. It makes you look cocky, it makes you look like you have some attitude, and we wanna avoid any kind of images like that that might be associated with us. So avoid chewing gum while you are presenting. Okay, so we're getting toward the end of behaviors. A couple last things to remember. One, you have to have a good positive attitude while you're presenting. Okay, this isn't as much a behavior, but at the same time it is, you have to show the people that you want to be there presenting to them. Okay, so I've got my little moving image here on the left. Uh, you can tell, and this is a girl that, you know, is known on the internet for not being excited to be in the Rebecca Black Friday video. Okay, go back, watch the video. You can see her on the screen and she is being paid money. She's being a friend to Rebecca, but she looks like she hates her life while she is performing in that video. You don't wanna be that person while you're up there speaking. You have to show people you love what you're talking about and you love being up there, even if you don't. That means not coming up and telling people how nervous you are, not coming up and saying you just wanna get it over with. The moment you walk into that room, you are as excited as possible to be ready to present. Because if you don't care about your presentation, why should anybody else? And if you seem nervous and like you don't wanna be there, well, let's think about our three C's of credibility, competence, care, and character. Competence, you don't know what you're doing because you obviously don't know that you're not supposed to show everybody you're nervous. Character, well, you don't look like somebody I can trust because you're gonna be nervous and freaked out. And then caring, well, you don't care about me enough to put in enough time to get yourself ready to go and to give me a good presentation. Okay, and not even just nerves, but think about somebody who you can tell doesn't want to be there. Well, that tells you they don't care about you either, right? So all three of our C's of credibility out the window, and that's not good. Okay, so you have to want to be there. Okay, so last thing, this is just a big rant that I have, but I want to make sure, especially in my online classes where you're watching these videos, Technology is going to become ever more important in any presentations you do ever, whether it be microphones, whether it be Zoom calls, whether it be teaching online, you have to know how to make your tech work. That's slides, that is your videos, that is your lights, that is your microphones, all of it. And you need to do it before people watch you. You need to show up before you are supposed to present and you should learn how the lights work, your speaker, where you're gonna be standing, what buttons you should push, if you need to push buttons at all, and you need to make sure your slides work, your videos load, your sounds work, your transitions happen. Everything that you don't account for makes you look worse the moment you get in front of people. <coughs> okay, so be professional and think about that. Okay, so some other specific things you wanna consider. If there is a podium, what do you do? The answer is, you don't lean on it. Podiums are meant to hold your papers. They're meant to keep some notes if you need them. And we're recommended not having notes in the first place, right? Ignore the podium, but don't lean on it. That invites weird movements. That invites slipping, possibly falling off the podium, knocking it over. Avoid them. Set notes if you have them and you need them. 
worry about your microphone. Just like right now, you need to make sure that your microphone on your computer works. If you're too loud, if you say things too fast, if you pop, 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 microphones have a hard time picking that up. You need to avoid that. You need to make sure your good volume that your computer, your mic can hear you. You also need it when you're using a handheld mic that you're not too close or too far. It takes practice. And it's something that you need to practice before you get in front of people. Make sure your slides work. Make sure they're sent to the correct place. Make sure if you have any videos or things like that, double check that they load. A lot of times students find that if they get to a place where there's no internet, their video no longer works. Their sound no longer works. Certain images don't pop up. You gotta find stuff out before you get up and show in front of people. Okay, we'll talk more about visual aids later this semester, but you gotta get all that stuff figured out. Okay, do your sound checks, do all that. And one final thing for your online presentation, you need to remember to think about what your audience sees in your camera. You wanna make sure as you're presenting that at least this much of your body is available to people. Okay, that we can see your hands, which gives us a little bit more to follow that we can see you, and you wanna consider what's going on in the background. Okay, I've got you, I'm here in my office, I'm here teaching, I'm fine with what's here. You being a professional speaker, you don't want people to see Kleenexes, okay? You don't want people to see your water bottle, your lunch, whatever might be there. You don't wanna be not dressed up, okay? If you're ever asked to stand up, you don't want people to know that you're in basketball shorts, not wearing pants at all sweatpants. If an employer asks you to stand up and you don't have pants, your interview is over. Your audience, if you move back, you unadjust, and all of a sudden people see you're in sweatpants, you're over. If you're in a spaghetti string shirt, if you're in a muscle shirt, guys, all that stuff's counting against you. Just because you're not in front of people doesn't mean we still don't expect the same level of professionalism that you should have in front of a class, which means you need to be dressed up, you need to make sure your inappropriate pictures, your whatever is on the walls is taken off, that you're in a plain, clean background, and that you look like somebody who's professional and cares enough about your audience to consider what's going on in your video with you. Okay, have good internet, buy a decent camera, and make sure that you are giving people your best, online, offline, all the above, okay? So with that, I think that about wraps up what I'd like to talk about and share with you in this video. So again, any questions, please feel free to email me. We went over how to make the different types of delivery methods you could do, as well as all sorts of quirks that you might come across. Those weren't all of them, but those are some of the biggest ones that students tend to struggle with most. I hope this helped. I hope you have a good day and good luck on your future speeches.